Okay, welcome back, everybody. Uh, this will be our third and final session of this special uh, symposium. I think we have five speakers in this session. Um, so up first, uh, it is really my pleasure to introduce my good friend, Michael Polymenis. Michael is at the uh, Department of Biochemistry and Biophysics at Texas A&M University. And he is going to be talking about work that, uh, that his lab has been doing on aging and yeast, coupling one carbon metabolism with longevity. All right. Uh, you can see me and, and uh, I presume? It looks good. Okay, good. Uh, let me get my laser pointer. All right. So um, I would also like to thank the organizers for the chance to present our work. Um, in this talk, I will mostly tell you about our work on the two, paralog on the two paralogs of the ribosomal protein RPL22 in yeast. Um, specifically how changes in methionine and serine metabolism explain the different phenotypes of these paralog mutants, which include lo lo longevity. Um, in unpublished work, I will also tell you how we have uh, followed up these results to learn about the more general role of this metabolic pathway, uh, one carbon metabolism uh, in longevity. So the work uh, has been a collaboration between my lab, uh, Brian Kennedy's lab, first at the back and now in Singapore and, and Matt's lab at the University of Washington. Uh, so here I, I just collected all the available data for ribosomal protein mutant phenotypes from yeast to humans. Uh, the, the second column shows the number of uh, RP genes for which mutations exist. And, and the third column, um, the number of distinct phenotypes that arise from these mutations. So there are many, many phenotypes. However, uh, oh, also note that yeast does not have more ribosomal proteins. It just has more, more genes that encode them because most RP genes in yeast are duplicated encoding highly similar paralogs. The last column shows the most common phenotypes in each species. Uh, so the number of phenotypes that arise from uh, RP mutations is very large, as I said, shown here in hundreds, but the most common ones are manifestations of hypo hypoproliferation, such as decreased proliferation, if you read this, uh, the descriptions here, uh, smaller cells, organs, or, or organisms. Um, so, uh, however, um, uh, in, in yeast, as I said, the spectrum is very large, and in yeast loss uh, of the one of the two paralogs can uh, lead to very specific phenotypes. Uh, for example, losing RPL22A sensitizes cells to uh, uh, reactive oxygen species. Uh, they they have defects. Uh, they, they have alterations in cell cycle progression, and of course, they they live longer. And in this case, we mean replicative longevity, so they, they divide more times. None of that happens if you lose the other paralog, the RPL22B, even though the two of them are actually very similar, they only differ at a few amino acids. So we want to know why, 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 why that is. You actually, you actually probably see, okay, here. All right. So first we isolated ribosomes from, uh, from asynchronously growing cells and look at the relative abundance of uh, RP, RPL22 uh, by mass spectrometry in wild type cells and cells that lack one of the two par paralogs or both. Uh, the double mutant is alive. Uh, so RPL22 is one of the few ribosomal proteins that's actually not essential. Uh, the, but although it is alive, the, the double mutant it divides uh, slower than either of, of the symbols. Uh, loss of the RPL22B, that does not really affect the uh, doubling time that, that much. It's, uh, it's the same as wild type. But RPL22A does. So, Wild type cells then, uh, if you look at the relative abundance of, of the two proteins, have a lot more RPL22A than B, so here in pink. Now, if you delete RPL22A, they try to make it up and they make more B, they don't quite catch up. Um, in, in the double mutant here, the levels you see are obviously the, the, the error, the, the, the noise in our measurements here. So, so that's the relative abundance in, in cells of the two proteins. What happens to the overall protein synthesis capacity in, in these mutants? So, so to answer, we quantified the incorporation of, the, of, a, of, of a methionine analog, HPG methionine, into newly synthesized proteins. Uh, through click chemistry now, if uh, um, th then a HPG fluoresces, and then you can quantify the, the, the incorporation by simply looking at cells under the fluorescence mi microscope shown here, or by quantifying the data uh, with flow cytometry. So protein synthesis is lower in RPL22A cells by about 50% uh, compared to wild type cells. 
um, the double mutant is also lower, and there is no drop in protein synthesis in, in RPL22B cells. So how does this drop now uh, in, uh, in protein synthesis lead to all the specific phenotypes that we, uh, we talked about, uh, about RPL22A? So first, we looked at the changes in the state, steady state mRNA levels in RPL22A versus B mutants. Uh, there were not many mRNAs affected, as shown here on the heat map. Uh, you see many rows because uh, we did this in a cell cycle dependent manner. Uh, we isolated uh, all these libraries. Uh, we made all these lab libraries throughout the cell cycle, starting in early G1 all the way down to mitosis. These were uh, um, uh, highly synchronous cells. Uh, and so every row is a different cell cycle po point, starting again early G1 all the way to mitosis. So very few targets, less than 100. And the only gene ontology that was enriched uh, is, uh, is this one, glucose metabolic process, which really says that uh, they have a slower, they, they express uh, um, less uh, genes that are related, key metabolic enzymes that are related with, with glycolysis. So that in the RPL22A cells. So lower glycolysis in RPL22 mutant cells. But then we really cared about the translationally controlled mRNAs. And for that, we did ribosome profiling from the exact same libraries throughout the cell cycle. And we compared the relative translational efficiency between RPL22A and uh, RPL22B mutants. Again, there were very few genes that were affected, about 80 or so. And most were down-regulated, you see here. And uh, the only gene ontology, meaning, sorry, down-regulated RPL22A mutants. And the only gene ontology, ontology that was significantly repressed um, uh, was uh, this one, serine family amino acid metabolic process. As shown uh, in the diagram at, at the bottom here, um, any, um, all, all the blue um, uh, uh, gene names highlighted here, all of them were repressed translationally in RPL22A cells uh, compared to, to, to the paralog mutants. So here is where we got a little excited because uh, we saw MET3, which uh, at the time was the only one known in this, from this list that uh, was known when deleted, the cells live longer. Um, but then all the other phenotypes, if you see what they, they do, they are actually part of the larger group of one carbon metabolism, and they are needed to make um, a variety of things that you need to grow and divide, including nucleotides, uh, amino acids, and also lipids not shown here. So that could explain very well the, the defect in growth and, and, and cell division and in the cell cycle phenotypes we had seen. And, or for example, they could also um, uh, explain the, the defect in the, in the, with the reactive oxygen species response, because of course you need the same pathway to make uh, glutathione. And we, we confirmed that the levels, for example, of MET3 are lower uh, in RPL22A cells compared to B cells. And actually the drop that we saw in this uh, immunoblots was about the same as we saw with the translational efficiency uh, from the ribosome profiling experiment. So this is kind of interesting also because it ties with uh, RNA-seq data that you saw in the previous slide. Of course, serine, which is the input of one carbon in this uh, folate-based metabolism, comes from glycolysis okay, through 3-phosphoglycerate. So they seem to tie together now. All right, then we looked at me metabolite levels from asynchronous cells in this case, and we compared the RPL22 versus RPL22B mutants. Uh, and uh, so this was untargeted metabolomics. And then we, um, uh, the metabolites whose levels changed significantly, we use them as input in the metabo analyst platform and identify the relevant pathways for enrichment. And the results were actually very concordant with uh, what we saw with RNA-seq and ribosic profiling. So glycolytic intermediates, again, were significantly down in RPL22A mutants compared to wild type or RPL22B. You can see 3-phosphoglycerate, which, as I said, is, a, is a where you make serine from. That was down in RPL22A cells. And also, we saw a bunch of uh, amino acids here, including glycine and serine metabolism, metabolism that you saw previously, or methionine metabolism. So it all made sense. Uh, we wanted to be sure, so we did some um, um, uh, targeted uh, amino acid measurements and shown here on, on, on the right. And again, glycine was down and serine was up. Uh, and that's kind of interesting because uh, it's actually important because a low glycine to serine ratio is diagnostic uh, for a low flux into one carbon metabolism. So that was cons consistent. We also found that tryptophan levels were lower and uh, you can ask me about that later. 
All right, so MET3 was a known longevity gene. What about if the whole idea that this, uh, this, all this uh, gene expression changes and metabolite changes uh, hit to one carbon metabolism, then maybe other genes in the pathway could also be longevity genes. And sure enough, here are shown two of them, SHM2 and AD17 in, in the replicative lifespan assay. So that was good. And in fact, uh, th there are more over the years that uh, uh, actually some done recently and some that uh, Matt and Brian have been doing for many years. So anything you see here uh, shown in, in bold, when you delete it in yeast, uh, uh, increases lifespan. Um, and the, in capitals are the equivalent names in, uh, in animals, in, uh, in, in mice. So, so this is, again, I hope I have, I, have, I have convinced you at this point that we really identified why RPL22A cells live longer. And, and all these phenotypes that you see here can be explained simply by changes, by downregulating the one carbon metabolism. And they also point to something about one carbon metabolism. If you, the more you think about it, I mean, it's really an excellent platform to integrate nutrient status, protein synthesis, and cell divisions and, and longevity. So if you look at the, if you compile all the data, not only from yeast, but also from, from worms, again, whatever you see here in bold has already been shown to be a, a longevity uh, mutation, uh, always loss of function. Um, so the others doesn't mean they are not, some of them have not been uh, tested, the ones that are not in bold. So really there is quite a few genes here in, in the pathway. Um, and for many of them, there are actually chemical inhibitors, uh, and, uh, and including this one that I highlight here, the target uh, for uh, the DHFR, which of course is methotrexate. And just to, to remind you how methotrexate works, what I, what I didn't show you in the previous slide is that, um, and I didn't mention, is that the, the useful form of folate for all these reactions is actually tetrahydrofolate, and all of them use that. Uh, but in this reaction where you make a thimidylate, uh, the tetrahydrofolate gets oxidized to dihydrofolate, which has to be reduced again by DHFR to make THF. So it's this reaction that methotrexate blocks and in effect causes a global folate deficiency. So THF levels are, you know, are down for all of the, all, all these uh, uh, reactions. So we added, uh, we tested various concentrations of uh, 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 low dose methotrexate in both yeasts so here and worms. And in both cases, we found that uh, low doses, and we're talking about one micromolar, um, extended longevity uh, in, in, in both systems. This is a re replicative longevity, and in worms, it's, a, it's, a, it's actual chronological lifespan. Um, so, so that was uh, exciting. Uh, what about uh, uh, if it's true for yeast and worms? What about mice? We really want to do that. We have not done that. Uh, so, so what you see here is a, is a, is a meta-analysis of published data. Me methotrexate uh, has been around for 70 years, but it has not been tested in, in, in longevity. But there have, there have been many toxicity studies that have been done decades ago, including for long-term low-dose exposure to methotrexate. Um, again, uh, at high doses, me me methotrexate is used to treat cancer, but uh, at low doses, it's actually still a first-line treatment for rheumatoid arthritis. So there is a lot of data around, and from all the experiments done in the 70s, with methotrexate given to mice from week seven to week 120, there was no toxicity associated with these doses, the up to 20 parts per million in the food. And here I plotted the data, and in five, so in all these conditions, and, and in five out of eight treatments that they had used in, all, in these old toxicity studies, the lifespan was actually increased. And, it, and the, the example you saw here, it was significantly increased. Uh, the p-value is less than 0.05 based on the low grant test. So what is actually astonishing about these old experiments uh, is that the treatment, they started treatment very early in life, uh, at week seven. And it is known that uh, for such an agent, uh, like, such as methotrexate, the toxicity is actually very high early in life. In fact, the LD50 at week 10 is, uh, is almost an order of uh, magnitude higher than week uh, 50 or something, if, if you give it. So one wonders what will happen if you actually start even uh, later in midlife and see if you see even a more pronounced effect. Um, but uh, at this point, I will close and I highlight again what I stated uh, about the, the ribosomal protein mutants. We think the one carbon metabolism fully explains the longevity of, uh, of RPL22A mutants and other phenotypes. Um, I showed you some initial evidence for about genetic and chemical interventions uh, in, in the same pathway. And I will close with the realization that whether we like it or not, we are all on the anti-intervention to prevent, uh, because you know, the US and many other countries, they supplement uh, staple foods with folates. 
And that makes sense because folate deficiency during pregnancy leads to birth defects. So, so that explains why the fortification of, let's say, flour with folate is, is beneficial. But um, if we are even remotely correct, maybe there is some rethinking that needs to be done about uh, you know, later in life uh, effects from a public health point of view. So again, thank you uh, for, for listening. I'll be happy to take any questions. Thanks, Michael. Um, that was great. And I, you know, I mean, I've always been sort of confused how, why the folate cycle and methionine cycle keep coming up over and over and over in these genetic screens in yeast and C. elegans in particular for longevity factors. And so it's nice to start to see this may be moving towards a more mechanistic understanding of, of, of what's going on. Um, so there are a few, few questions in the chat. So Alex Chen is asking, uh, doesn't giving massive doses of B vitamins significantly affect 1C metabolism? Uh, and he also asks whether studies have been done on folate inhibition and lifespan. So, okay, I'll start with the second one. So folate inhibition and lifespan, as far as I know, methotrexate, again, this is the slides I showed you in the end, it has not been done, uh, so specifically, uh, for other antifolates. Uh, I don't know. I don't think so. I have not seen them. Um, in, in people, uh, there, there have been uh, um, observational studies. Uh, so people who take it for, uh, for you know, uh, rheumatoid arthritis, they do appear to, live, to have reduced mortality, especially from cardiovascular disease. There was a big clinical trial that was done to, to see if that correlation holds. Uh, if you have another heart, if you had a heart attack, methotrexate will not inhibit you, uh, will not help you from, from not getting another one. So whether you have an overall uh, benefit, I don't know uh, at, at this point, but that's clearly something we want to do. Um, but I don't think it has been done in, in longevity studies. I, I have not seen it. I would love to see it. And I forgot about the first question about uh, vitamin. Oh, well, I think the question is more whether high doses of folate will affect 1C metabolism. And Alex also asks whether it might have an impact on, on lifespan extension from CR. So sort of going the other direction. So well, the other direction, I'm sorry. And I was going- No, no, he asked about both, but I think that was the other half of the question. So, so I don't know actually, if anybody has supplemented uh, fully with folate and then see, see what happens. I, I, I don't, I, I have not seen it, but I don't know, I could, I could be wrong. So a, any standard diet has folates, as far as I know, even in mice, I mean, it, it, it is folate rich. Um, to fully test it, I mean, to go extra, I don't know. I have not seen it. So I, I was, so that's it. I don't know. That's the answer. It's an interesting question. And, and just to give yeah. a little bit of context. So there is data in C. elegans on, on folate restriction by inhibiting folate production of the microbiome. Of the microbiome, yes. Folate. And that does extend lifespan. Yes. Um, the other sort of interesting connection here is David Gems published a paper that metformin's mechanism of action in worms, at least, is through folate restriction. And I think there's a little bit of data in, in mammalian cells that metformin affects one carbon metabolism, right. although people there have proposed AMP kinase as the mechanism. So again, there are all these connections and it's really neat to, to start to see start to see some, some, uh, some mechanistic insight. Um, Jess has a question uh, about why it is mechanistically, do you have any idea why it is that in the, the RPL22A mutant that you get differential expression of these 1C metabolism genes? Is it a translational mechanism? What, what's going on there? Okay, so I, I th on that one, I'm biased because uh, yes, I, I think we do get uh, mostly translational control. Uh, this is that, that was the output of the assay because we used ribosome profiling directly to measure that, which directly reflects uh, uh, translational efficiency. How that happens, um, I, I don't know. H about half of them have upstream open reading frames. We want to test them in more detail to see why, what's the actual me me mechanism. That's, that's a big uh, thing that my lab wants to do. But I don't have any more information about the precise mechanism. But I do think it's a, it's a, um, about the cis elements, or if, if there are even any other mRNA binding proteins that bind in a particular way and inhibit some of them, but not others. Uh, we want to know. But I do believe it's it's translational in the case of RPL twenty two A. And and another the the second part of Jess's question is: Is there any connection between one uh, C enzymes and autophagy or this? RPL22 folate mechanism and autophagy that you know about? I, I don't know. I, I was saying, I, I don't know. 
something to be studied in the future. Yep. Okay, yep. Uh, we're at time. So thank you, Michael. That was great. Thank you. Thank, thank you. All the questions. Um, so our next uh, presentation, this will this will be a video recording because uh, our speaker uh, couldn't be here uh, in person this. So we will have a video presentation uh, by Nicole Jenkins, who is at the Melbourne Dementia Research Center, uh, University of Melbourne, Australia. There will be no questions after the video presentation, so we'll just go right to the next speaker. And um, Nicole's talk title is Changes, Changes in Ferrous Iron and Glutathione Promote Ferroptosis and Frailty in Aging C. Elegans. Good afternoon. My name is Nicole Jenkins. I'm from the Melbourne Dementia Research Centre in Australia. I would like to thank the senior editors, Jess and Matt, for putting this special issue and symposium together. I'm sorry that the time zone differences mean that I cannot join you in person today. I'd like to begin by acknowledging the senior authors on the paper, my mentors, Gavin McColl and Ashley Bush, as well as all of the other authors who contributed to this research. Our group is particularly interested in the impact of iron on ageing. Iron is a trace metal found in all animals and is essential for life, with all eukaryotes exploiting its redox chemistry for various activities such as DNA replication and growth. Our previous research has caused us to question whether an early developmental dependence on iron for reproduction and cellular biochemistry represents an ancient and conserved liability in late life. Iron exists in cells primarily as either Fe2+, known as ferrous iron, or Fe3+, known as ferric iron. Labile iron in the ferrous form is a potent oxidant which can cause substantial stress to the cell. Unregulated redox cycling between Fe2+, and Fe3+, is a known overt cellular stress. This kind of biochemistry is mitigated by a range of storage and chaperone pathways to ensure that the labile or reactive iron is kept to a minimum. Intracellular iron concentration increases over lifetime in many species, including humans, and in particular within the brain. This accumulation of iron may be an underlying contributor to the progression of age-related conditions such as Parkinson's and Alzheimer's diseases. The recently described iron-dependent cell death pathway, known as ferroptosis, may be the missing link between oxidative stress, aging, and neurodegenerative diseases. Ferroptosis has been widely studied in cell model systems with a focus on cancer biology. Ferroptosis kills malignant cells but may also be inappropriately activated in conditions such as ischemic injury and neurodegeneration. This cell death mechanism is executed by phospholipid hydroperoxides induced by either iron-dependent lipoxygenases or by radical-mediated auto-oxidation that is catalyzed by iron. Under homeostatic conditions, the ferroptotic signal is terminated by glutathione peroxidase 4, also known as GPX4, a phospholipid hydroperoxidase that uses glutathione as a cofactor. While the signalling that re regulates ferroptosis is being studied in depth, the role of iron load in this death signal remains to be characterised. We wondered if the age-related increase in ferrous iron may also result in ferroptosis during ageing. Could late-life iron dyshomeostasis be sufficient to trigger ferroptosis in late life and what role this might have in ageing? To study this, we used the nematode model system of Cenorhabditis elegans. For those unfamiliar with this system, many essential characteristics that are central to human biology exist in C. elegans. In addition, many insights into the biology of ageing had their genesis in the study of this model. During ageing, C. elegans exhibit characteristics of senescence seen in higher organisms, including slowed movement and muscle wasting. Our laboratory has previously demonstrated that C. elegans accumulates iron over adult lifetime. We have done this using a number of analytical techniques, including several synchrotron-based imaging methods. We've also shown that ferrous iron, the substrate for ferroptosis, increases during aging. For the research we have detailed in our eLife paper, we first began by modeling acute ferroptosis in C. elegans. 
To do this, we use the chemical compound DEM, which conjugates glutathione, causing acute depletion. Glutathione is suggested to be the dominant coordinating ligand for cytosolic ferrous iron and is also the substrate used by GPX4 to clear the lipid peroxides that induce ferroptotic cell death. We found that treating young animals with differing doses of DEM reduced glutathione levels in a dose-dependent manner. We also observed a dose-dependent effect on survival, with approximately 50% of animals dying within 24 hours of exposure to 10 millimolar DEM. These results confirm that treatment with DEM represents an acute stress that reduces glutathione levels and causes death. We then examined the changes in glutathione levels and survival after DEM exposure during ageing. As the animals aged, their glutathione levels decreased. These older am animals with reduced glutathione were significantly more sensitive to DEM-mediated glutathione depletion. These results suggested that older animals may be sensitive to cell death by ferroptosis. To explore this further, we we employed two interventions. The first intervention was to use SIH, an iron chelator, to reduce the labile iron pool. Importantly, SIH binds to iron in a redox silent manner, so it should reduce oxidative stress within the cell. The second intervention was to inhibit ferroptosis using liproxtatin, a peroxyl radical trapping ferroptosis inhibitor. When we looked at DEM treated animals, we found that pre-treatment with either compound improved DEM resistance of adult C. elegans with a more marked effect seen under SIH treatment. This increased survival in SIH treated animals may be due to the increased basal levels of glutathione in these animals, which is also preserved after DEM treatment. Because we were interested to know if we were observing ferroptosis, we wanted to determine whether individual cell death precedes organismal death. To do this, we used propidium iodide to visualise moribund cells in vivo. Propidium iodide is a fluorescent intercalating agent that binds to DNA, but cannot cross the membrane of live cells, making it possible to identify the nuclei of recently dead or dying cells. This is shown in the image of the worm at, at the top of the slide. When we treated young animals with DEM and propridium iodide, we observed death of individual cells within the animals prior to organismal death. Animals pre-treated with both SIH and liproxtatin exhibited lower levels of cell death. We also examined animals for evidence of cell death during ageing. We observed cell death in four, six and eight day old adults. This cell death was significantly attenuated by both liproxtatin and SIH treatment. Our results with cell death and compound treatment were also supported by changes in lipid peroxidation markers, which I do not have time to discuss today. Lowering cellular iron suppresses ferroptosis, but the peroxyl radical trapping ferroptosis inhibitors such as liproxtatin are not expected to change iron levels. We examined the impact of SIH and liproxtatin interventions on iron levels over lifespan in live C. elegans using synchrotron-based X-ray fluorescence microscopy, the details of which can be found in our paper. Using these imaging methods, we found that both total iron and aerial density increased with age in control animals as expected based on our previous work. SIH dramatically reduced the aerial density of iron and also reduced the variance within populations. But this effect was not seen in Lickbrockstatin treated animals. Determining the level of ferrous versus ferric iron in a living organism is quite a challenge but can be determined using a technique known as physanes that we have refined in our laboratory to measure the speciation of iron in C. elegans. Zanes refers to X-ray absorption near edge spectroscopy using fluorescence detection for visualization and directly assesses the in vivo coordination environments of metal ions in biological specimens. 
Since Fe2 plus in the labile iron pool is the specific substrate for ferroptosis, and we have previously reported that this rises with ageing in C. elegans, we investigated both DEM treatment and the impact of our interventions during ageing. The physones allowed us to evaluate steady state iron speciation to determine the ratio of Fe2 plus to Fe3 plus. We found that DEM increased the proportion of ferrous iron. We also observed an age-related increase in ferrous iron. This age-related increase in the Fe2 plus fraction was normalised to that of a young animal by both lipoxstatin and SIH treatments. We've demonstrated the effects of both SIH and lipoxstatin in adult animals. We confirmed the expected effects of reduction of iron in the case of SIH and of reducing cell death and lipoperoxidation for both SIH and lipoxstatin consistent with ferroptosis. But what about lifespan? As you can see from the results presented on this slide, both SIH and lipoxstatin increased lifespan with an average median increase of 100% and 70% respectively. However, both of these interventions appear to affect the animals in different ways, with markedly different hazard rates observed relative to control populations and also between the two different treatments. What is difficult to convey in a paper is just how different the treated animals looked and behaved. The SIH treated animals appeared quite robust and vigorous just prior to death. Whereas liproxtatin treated animals seem to be aging in a similar manner to control animals at an early age and then exhibited mid-life vigour, which can be seen with the respective hazard rates in the other graph on this slide. Because of the large increase in lifespan that we observed and the striking differences in behaviour we saw in aging animals, we looked at how our interventions compared to previous results in aging by employing the temporal scaling analysis published by Nicholas Straustrup and colleagues in their elegant paper from 2016. We thank these authors for sharing their data and methods with us to enable us to do this analysis. These authors found that diverse interventions including temperature, oxidative stress and disruptions of insulin-like signaling pathways and other genetic interventions all altered lifespan by temporal scaling, which they defined as an apparent stretching or shrinking of time. For an intervention to extend lifespan by temporal scaling, it must alter all physiological determinants of the risk of death to the same extent throughout adult life. Our results indicated that neither SIH nor liproxtatin altered lifespan by temporal scaling. This suggests that neither intervention acts as a global regulator of ageing, but perhaps affects late life frailty instead. It's worth noting that other interventions that were reported to affect lifespan outside this temporal scaling model by the previous sources had marked effects on development and fitness, which were not readily apparent in our animals. Interventions that increase lifespan in C. elegans often do so at the detriment of fitness and health span. We made a number of comparisons regarding the fitness related traits such as body size, fertility and movement between treated and control populations. We found that iron collation with SIH surprisingly resulted in an increase in the size of the animals, with these populations continuing to grow compared to control populations indicating improved vigour to a later age. In contrast, liproxtatin treated animals were not different to control animals with respect to size. With respect to fertility, the results shown on this slide indicate that early fertility is not affected by either iron collation or ferroptosis inhibition. However, the liproxtatin does significantly reduce overall reproductive output related, relative to untreated animals whilst SIH has no effect on the overall number of progeny produced. The effects of both interventions on movement parameters were also assessed, since peak motile velocity has been previously demonstrated to correlate strongly with C. elegans health span and longevity, and may be considered to be the best estimate of health span in this model system. As expected, control animals showed a steady decline in maximum velocity as they aged. 
Treatment with SIH and Liproxetin markedly improved the maximum velocity of aging animals with increases also seen in distance traveled and mean velocity. In summary, the research that I've discussed today indicates that both Liproxetin and SIH protect against acute glutathione depletion. With respect to iron levels, only SIH limits age-related iron increase, but both Liproxetin and SIH limit the increase of ferrous iron with age. Treatment to reduce iron and inhibit ferroptosis both significantly increase lifespan, but our treatments with SIH and Liproxetin seem to act at specific life phases rather than resulting in global regulation of ageing. Our results indicate that targeting iron can improve health span with minimal fitness trade-offs. Limiting ferroptosis in adult animals may promote healthy ageing and also has the potential in the treatment of age-related diseases. And again, I would like to thank the co-authors of um, this work listed here, and also the Australian Research Council, University of Melbourne and Miller Foundation who have provided funding for this work. Thank you. All right, and thank you to Nicole Jenkins for uh, preparing that, that video. Uh, now we will return to our live programming. So next up uh, is Hosni Sharif, uh, McGill University in Canada. And I see Hosni there. And, and the title of his talk is going to be Senolytics to Reduce Pain and Degeneration in Human Invertebral Discs. Intervertebral Discs, I'm sorry. Hello, everyone. Thank you for having me today. And uh, I'll talk about uh, the role of senolytics in disc degeneration and low back pain. I'll try to introduce low back pain for those who are not uh, familiar with. So, it's a global age-related health problem uh, associated with intervertebral disc degeneration and experienced by about uh, by 80% of individuals at some time in their life. And it's the number one cause of years needed with disability. Uh, low back pain, despite its prevalence, it is little known about the cellular and molecular mechanism leading to painful degeneration leaving surgical uh, removal and vertebral fusion in end stage of disease as the most common treatment. The personal cost uh, in reduced quality of life and in economic cost to health care system are enormous and exceed, as an example, in US $100 billion per dollar. So here is yeah, here is an image of uh, the vertebral disc, non degenerate the red is the vertebral body and yellow is the two discs. Uh, commonly, the disc is divided into a distinct zone of cartilage and, and plate, not shown here, but the most important for us here is the outer annulus fibrosis that will be labeled AF through the representation and the central gelatinous NT, which is all uh, are with characteristic different cell population with different biochemical and biomechanical properties. With an increasing proteus protection inflammatory factor, this starts to losing cell proteoglycan collagen network and mechanical property. This Hosni, can, I, can I interrupt, yeah. interrupt you for a second? I'm sorry. Um, your voice is kind of muffled. Is it possible to speak uh, directly into the microphone? Yeah, let's start them trying. Uh, That's is it better now? Yep. Is it any okay. better? It's better, yes, thank you. Yeah, okay, I, I have to raise my voice, I think. Uh, so yeah, uh, the stress of the matrix catabolism, when it over, catabolism, when it overcomes the anabolism, it leads to more production of those cytokine chemical and disc uh, degeneration. And here it's an image of a disc degeneration. We found also an increased number of senescent cell in the general disc. It is report, our introduced cell center just fastly for people that, so it's an irreversible cell cycle RS that can be caused either by replicative senescence, in case of aging by telomere attrition, or by stress-inducing premature senescence, which is in the case of our disc. 
our most common that is caused by external or stimuli like oxidative stress, you know, toxic agent. So the cell became resistant to apoptosis with cell size and morphologic alteration. And uh, not regulation of the cyclic dependent kinase inhibitor like, like P16, P21, an active agent of nuclear factor like NFKPD. It also secretes an array of uh, factors called senescence associated secretory phenotype, shortly SAT, that includes cytokine, chemokine, protease, growth factor, and angiogenic factor. Those factors will lead to more degeneration of the disc and low back pain. It's reported previously the presence of an senescent cell in degenerate disc, and we quantify in our first paper the difference between NP and AF within in degenerate and non-degenerate disc, and we found an increase of those uh, in the number of senescent cells by P16 staining, uh, and an increase also in SAT factor, as an example here, to cytokine IL-6, IL-8, and two proteases, MMP3 and MMP3. It's important here to highlight that those degenerate discs are coming from symptomatic uh, donor. They go through vertebral fusion or disc replacement. So then we decide because of this variability that can came from the inter-donor with age, sex, or way of life, to look further within the same individual, two discs, one degenerate and non-degenerate, and try to find if there is any difference, whether in number of senescent cell accumulation or size factor release. And indeed it is, and we find an increase in both NP and AF in size factor that we can relate it more to disc degeneration than any other factor. Then we also tested different senolytic. We show here the two most potential that are ovanidin, which is a natural senolytic with known anti-inflammatory property and RG712, uh, which is an ethylene 3 a inhibitor. It's a synthetic senolytic, and it's uh, acting through the uh, blocking the interaction between P53 and MDF2, and has not any documented anti-inflammatory. So both senolytic reduce the number of senescent cells uh, when we compare them to the untreated group. We tried to look at what are the pathway, possible pathway that, or, uh, that are affected gene by the two compounds. We did a qPCR with a preset uh, plate with 90 genes that are mainly uh, uh, cell cycle gene or senescent gene. And we find out that uh, ovanilin is uh, treating, uh, affecting 40 genes with 30 upregulated and 10 downregulated, while RG affected only eight genes with six upregulated and two downregulated. This brought us to look at the possible pathway affected with those gene variability, and we found that RG is affecting only one pathway, which is the cell death and survival, with touching uh, affecting MDM2 and P21 as expected. For vanillin, it was more broader effect. We see affecting three possible networks with the cell death and survival, connective tissue development and function, and cell cycle. We, this, we found that now that vanillin can act through P16 by blocking the cyclin dependent kinase to drive the senescent cell to apoptosis, while RG will have, uh, act through his P53 MDM2 known pathway uh, to drive the senescent cell on apoptosis and the proliferation of the remaining cell. Then we looked at the media of those cell cultures uh, and we confirmed the effect, uh, anti-inflammatory effect of, uh, of amine. But so, I think we are also able to see that RG was able to reduce the SAS factor there is difference between the two compounds in the uh, types and the effect uh, of the on reducing SAS factor, which we'll go later after on that. Then we try to validate this result in vitro in an ex vivo organ culture, where we want to see if the drugs can reach and target the senescent cell in human IVD tissue culture at ex vivo. So we isolate three days from the same donor and we try to inject, uh, we inject them one uh, with the control 
and two with uh, ergy and vanillin. And we will culture them for 28 days by changing media every three, four days. We perform a pre-MRI and post-MRI. So MRI is uh, the clinical tool to evaluate health data. Uh, to validate, to see the, pro, the effect of the treatment. We also collect the media and measure the stat factor release to see the anti-inflammatory effect of the both compounds if it's validated. And we did also histology to confirm if the senescent cells are removed after the treatment. First, we looked at the uh, uh, histology and we find that both compounds specifically remove senescent cells with not really big effect on the proliferation, just uh, non-significant effect on the proliferation. They also remove the SAS factor uh, in the media. And at the MRI, we compare the pre-treatment uh, disc to the post-treatment. So we found in the control here that uh, the disc lose of the proteoglycan, while RG and vanillin kind of increase, significantly increase this uh, proteoglycan compound uh, that we can identify here by a higher red intensity compared to the treatment for the both uh, organin and RG. So to resume this section, when the disc is exposed to aging or environmental insult, they accumulate senescent cells that secrete cytokine, chemokine, that will degrade the matrix and lead to intervertebral disc degeneration and low back pain. We aim with those senolytic to remove or reduce the number of those senescent cells and reduce the factor they release for a better health of the disc. If we act late, let's say for a degenerate disc, we think that we will reduce the pain, but earlier treatment will be able to prevent degeneration and disc and low back pain. Now we are working with the, to validate those results in vivo. Our model is the sparkler mice, which have a progressive age dependent and vertebral disc degeneration and back pain that starts at four months. We looked at the senescent cell in sparkler mice and we compare it to all type and we see accumulation of senescent cell in degenerate IVD from sparkler. And we test the two senolytic in an ex vivo culture from nine, or nine months old sparse mice. And we found that both senolytic reduced significantly IL-6, which is one of the main stat factors. With those results, we encourage to do the, the evaluation of the pain behavior in the animal. We use for that the grip strength to measure the axial discomfort and the von Frey filament and acetone test to measure the radiating pain. So we give this mice uh, by oral gavage weekly starting at five months, the two drugs and uh, no, the wild type and spark were not treated with the stenotic. So we see here in black, the spark and in green, the wild type. And you see that there is more pain for the spark in our mice and we improve with a vanillin in blue and energy in it the grip force and reduce the discomfort, the axial discomfort for those animals after two months of treatment. We also reduce the pain, the radiating pain by one fray for, and the, and the sensitivity to the cold with acetone test after two months of treatment also. So to resume here, we have found that the two stenolytic, RG and vanillin, first, they both specifically target and kill senescent cells or in vitro and ex vivo. Uh, Ovanilin through P16 and RG through P53 MDM2 interaction to activate cyclic dependent kinase and direct those senescent cells to apoptose. They promote proliferation of the remaining cell and decrease that factor and pain mediator and proteus, proteus which will induce an extracellular matrix sensitive. We validated also the species compatibility and showed an improvement in the behavioral sign of pain in vivo. We are currently measuring the SASP in vivo, the effect of the two compounds, and evaluating the pain in a female cohort so to see if there is any sex difference. We also tried to 
change the treatment, whether as presented before, so early treatment versus later treatment to see if the drugs can prevent the disc degeneration or it's treated for the older animal. We also try now a combination treatment because we think that both compounds may target different cell population and the combination of the treatment will lead to better results. I would like with that to thank all the lab members that contribute to this work and our collaborator and the, agent, the funding agency and you for your listening. Thank you. Thanks, Hazi. That was uh, really interesting. So we have a couple of questions. The first one um, is asking about uh, ovanillin administration for patients. And uh, the specific question is, what do you think would be the best way Hello. Oh, Matt. Sorry. Yeah, it gets. Yeah, it's frozen. Um, okay. You hear the question? The question oh, no, was about. Get... Okay. The question was about uh, what would be the best way of administration of. Oh, it's my connection <laughs> of ovanillin for patients. So uh, that's a good question. So we try with the animal model, uh, uh, because we think that it will be fair, maybe damaging the disc by needles when we try to do injection in the disc. This will be uh, a, to test. Now we show that with the oral gavage, we have a, an improvement of pain behavior. This will be a, an interesting way, but uh, I'll think that uh, also, ideally, we, if we could do a local injection or a local, uh, uh, let's say, diffusion of the compound, that would be more perfect because it will be on site and it's a uh, local, uh, I would say, I would say lo uh, local will be better than systemic in this case. But we try now systemic and it's showing a good uh, result. Uh, that makes sense. Uh, uh, the other question is also related to vanillin. And are you aware of other groups that have published on vanillin senotherapeutic effects? Um, is there any epidemiological data uh, to suggest mm -hmm. this relationship? So the, the thing on senolytics, no. But uh, curcumin, or there is some publication on curcumin. And we did also publish on curcumin. And uh, which is the uh, ovanillin is a metabolite of curcumin, and uh, they are showing senolytic effects uh, for that. But the thing is, uh, curcumin has a very low solubility and uh, had some problem for uh, treat for treatment. That's why we opt for vanillin that shows first better effect and lower toxicity to curcumin. And yes, there is. If I'm going to make sure, yes, there is some result on. Uh, curcumin, not vanillin, but uh, not on epidemiology at that point. We are like really at the early step. Uh, the good thing is an FDA approved compound that makes things more easier after if you want to do uh, testing, like validate this uh, as a drug. And then a sort of related question to that is have you checked to see if there are decreases in senescent cells in other tissues from these kinds of treatments? Uh, not for, for, we just did for the disc, but it should be a good, we do on bone. I think we have just the preliminary data that shows a decrease with those senolytic and in uh, cartilage uh, with uh, chondrocytes. But this early in vitro study, preliminary study, just, uh, but no, we didn't really look at other tissue. Okay, and then the, the last, well, well, another question is, what do you know about the mechanism of action for these commas? The first one, I think you said the RG drug is an NDM2 inhibitor. Do you know yes. what the mechanism is for vanillin for targeting senescent cells? For now, we know that uh, it's acting by blocking those cyclic dependent kinase, but honestly with, uh, you know, a preset 
uh, place that we already decide to choose what are the genes that we want to look at, which is more senescence and uh, cell cycle gene, and you have this network, it looks to be a broader effect with different uh, pathway that could be implicated, but we didn't really look at that. I will say that it will be a good uh, project to look at the mechanism to confirm the how the uh, vanillin is acting precisely. Perfect. Um, okay, so so in the interest of time, we're going to move on to the next speaker. There are a couple of questions yep. for you in the chat. I don't mind yep. um, uh, answering those. And thank you for the, the great uh, presentation. Very interesting. You're welcome. Thank you. Next up is uh, Fivos Borbolis. Uh, is that right? It's a video presentation. And yep. then Fivos will join us for questions. And yep. it looks like we're queued up. Okay, so he is at the uh, Biomedical Research Foundation the Academy of Athens in Greece, and the talk title is MRNA Decapping as a Modulator of Aging and Development. Good evening, everyone. This is Fibos Borbolis from Athens, and I will be presenting recent work from our lab concerning the role of MRNA decapping as a modulator of aging and development. In eukaryotes, all RNA polymerase to transcribed RNAs are characterized by a methylated guanine cap structure that is added co-transcriptionally at the 5' end. This 5' cap defines key aspects of an mRNA's life cycle through its interactions with various cap-binding proteins. In the cytoplasm, capped mRNAs interact with the translational machinery to produce the corresponding peptides. Although removal of the 5' cap, a process termed decapping, is the first step in the major 5' to 3' mRNA decay pathway, Decapped transcripts are not committed to degradation, but can also be stored in ribonucleoprotein granules, maintaining the potential to be recapped and returned to the translational pool. Such cycle rounds of decapping and recapping provide an extra level of post-transcriptional regulation of gene expression. mRNA decapping is performed by an enzyme comprised of two subunits, termed DCP1 and DCP2. This hollow enzyme interacts with many additional cofactors that regulate its activity, forming multiprotein decapping complexes. Our work focuses on the regulatory decapping subunit DCP1, which is essential for the function of the enzyme. Previous work from our lab with animated worm C. elegans has revealed that depletion of the DCP1 worm ortholog DCAP1 affects various aspects of its physiology, resulting in short-lived animals that are also sensitive to stress, produce less progeny and exhibit developmental defects. Neuronal DCAP1 in particular has been shown to impact developmental decisions by regulating the expression of heterochronic genes. In order to explore the requirement of DCAP1 in each tissue for a normal lifespan, we generated a series of transgenic lines that overexpress a DCAP1 GFP fusion in different tissues of a DCAP1 mutant animal. Out of the four major worm tissues, expression of DCAP1 in the nervous system was enough to restore lifespan to wild type levels. Expression in the intestine improved lifespan to a smaller extent, while expression in the epidermis or the musculature had a negligible effect on longevity. The fact that overexpression of this DCAP1 GFP transient exclusively in the nervous system was able to fully rescue the short lived Newton phenotype suggests a strong positive regulation of lifespan, even though DCAP1 is missing from other tissues. We therefore examined the impact of overexpressing all tissue specific DCAP1 GFP fusions on the impact of otherwise wild type animals. In agreement with our complementation analysis, neural overexpression of the transient resulted in a significant increase of both median and maximum lifespan, intestinal overexpression caused a smaller extension, while epidermal or muscular overexpression had no significant impact. However, both neuronal and intestinal overexpression of DCAP1 failed to extend the lifespan of TCAP2 mutant worms, which lack any decapping activity, indicating that the mechanism that mediates longevity depends on mRNA decapping. The control of organismal lifespan through the nervous system usually involves the function of neurosecreted molecules that regulate the function of longevity-regulating pathways in distal cells and tissues. The most prevalent among these pathways is that of insulin IGF-like signaling which serves a conserved role in regulating longevity from worms to humans. C. elegans possesses a single insulin IGF-like receptor that integrates input from at least 40 insulin-like peptides to control the localization and activity of DAF16 FOCTO transcription factor. 
Under conditions of reduced insulin signaling, TAF16 translocates to the nucleus and regulates the transcription of longevity-related genes. We found that in the absence of DAF16, overexpression of DCAP1 fails to induce longevity. Moreover, silencing of DAF2 that reduces insulin IGF-like signaling and results in extreme longevity completely masks the effect of neuronal DCAP1 overexpression, which failed to have an additive effect and extend lifespan further. Collectively, our results indicate that decapping in the nervous system acts through insulin IGF-like signaling to regulate DAF16 activity and induce longevity. In order to identify the signal that mediates the relationship between neuronal decapping and insulin signaling, we assess the effect of TCAP1 depletion and neuronal TCAP1 overexpression on the mRNA levels of five insulin-like peptides with a well-established role in neuroendocrine lifespan control. Our quantitative PCR analysis revealed that 4 out of 5 insulin-like peptides are unaffected by DCAP1 levels. However, the abundance of N7 mRNA was almost doubled in young DCAP1 animals and further increased in mid-aged worms parallel to age-masked wild types. Moreover, N7 mRNA levels were significantly reduced in mid-aged worms that overexpressed neuronal DCAP1 in comparison to wild-type animals. To clarify whether DCAP1 affects N7 abundance transcriptionally or post-transcriptionally, we monitor the fluorescence of wild-type and DCAP1 animals carrying a transcriptional N7 promoter GFP reporter in various ages. In agreement with previous reports, we detected fluorescence mainly in head neurons and some intestinal cells, with advanced age resulting in increased intestinal fluorescence for both strains. Even so, Total fluorescence intensity of TCAP1 worms was graded at all examined ages, arguing in favor of TCAP1 regulating in 7 expression at the level of transcription. This effect, however, is restricted to the intestine and does not apply to neurons that had no difference in fluorescence between backgrounds. So far, our data have outlined a model where TCAP1 levels in the nervous system regulated in 7 insulin like peptide transcription in the intestine strongly implying the involvement of active neurosecretion. We thereby measured the fluorescence of the same N7 transcriptional reporter in mutant ANC31 worms, where dense corn vesicle mediated secretion of neuropeptides is impaired. In this mutant background, TCAP1 depletion failed to induce N7 transcription, revealing that the observed intertissue communication is mediated by a neuropeptide released by dense core vesicles. Previous work has shown that the N7 is a DAF2 insulin receptor agonist that activates insulin signaling, but is also a target of the downstream transcription factor DAF16 FOXO that inhibits its transcription in intestinal cells. This self-regulatory mechanism, though, does not apply to neurons, where N7 transcription is not affected by insulin signaling. We thereby argued that increased neurosecretion of N7 could account for its increased transcription in the intestine of TCAP1 mutants. Indeed, we observed that fluorescence of N7 promoter transcriptional reporter is not induced in N7 DCAP1 double mutants where no functional N7 peptide is produced. Collectively, our data show that neuronal DCAP1 regulates N7 transcription in the intestine by affecting the amount of neurosecreted N7 peptide. Since we did not observe any induction of N7 transcription in neurons, if DCAP1 regulates the abundance of neuronal N7, that should occur at the level of mRNA stability. We thus used N7 newton worms to express an N7 transient exclusively in neurons and assessed N7 mRNA levels, which thereby correspond strictly to neuronal transcripts. Both young and mid-aged DCAP1 newtons exhibited a two-fold increase in neuronal N7 mRNA levels, revealing that indeed TCAP1 deficiency stabilizes neuronal N7 transcripts. Due to its self-regulatory function, N7 is considered as a carrier of FOXO to FOXO signaling that coordinates the rate of aging across the organism. Consequently, the deficit in N7 induction during aging that we observed in neuronal DCAP1 overexpressing animals could be the reason for their prolonged lifespan. To support this theory, post-developmental silencing of N7 increased the lifespan of wild-type worms but failed to further promote longevity of the already long-lived animals that overexpressed TCAP1 in their neurons. It is thus safe to conclude 
that low levels of IN7 trigger longevity during neuronal TICAP1 overexpression. Given the strict evolutionary conservation of both 5' prime, 3' prime mRNA decay machinery and the mechanisms of Leisman determination, we reason that the connection between neuronal decapping and aging might not be restricted to C. elegans. We therefore studied this relationship in the fly Drosophila melanogaster. Since nanomutants of DCP1, that is the fly ortholog of TCAP1, are proper lethal, we used the UAS GAL4 system to express double strand RNA and induce DCP1 silencing specifically in neurons. The same approach was used to overexpress a DCP1 GFP transgene exclusively in the nervous system of the fly. In agreement with our C. elegans data, Neuronal lockdown of DCP1 caused a dramatic reduction of lifespan, while its neuronal overexpression resulted in long-lived flies that exhibit a significant increase in both median and maximum lifespan. The latter effect, though, only occurred when transient overexpression was initiated after the completion of development. Overexpression throughout development did not have an impact on lifespan, suggesting that high levels of DCP1 in neurons are detrimental during development and counteract their longevity-promoting effect during adulthood. While studying the lifespan, we observed that most flies with neuronal DCP1 deficiency exhibit a phenotype characterized by unexpanded wings, an unexpanded thorax, and the lack of cuticle tanning. All these traits are affected by the execution of a post-eclosion program that takes place during the late phases of the last egg disease. This process is orchestrated by the release of a neuropeptide termed bursicon and its receptor rickets. Our preliminary results show that both bursicon and rickets mRNA levels are reduced by DCP1 knockdown in neurons, suggesting that neuronal mRNA decapping affects bursicon signaling. However, further experiments are required in order to confirm this notion. To examine whether the origins of wing malformation can be traced in early events of dermophogenesis, we dissected wing imaginal discs from third distal larvae with neuronal DCP1 knockdown and examined cell and tissue morphology by visualizing a facting. Despite the neuronal nature of the knockdown, most isolated discs exhibited widespread structural abnormalities associated with abnormal epithelial folding. However, by starting or stopping the knockdown after the completion of larval development, we were able to isolate flies with normal wing discs but unexpanded wings, and vice versa. Consequently, abnormalities in wing imaginal disc tissue pattern and aberrant adult wing morphology are two distinct results of neuronal DCP1 knockdown that occur independently at different developmental stages, making clear that mRNA decapping neuronal cells can affect developmental effects in a cell non-autonomous manner. Collectively, our data have uncovered an evolutionarily concerned role for the regulatory subunit of the mRNA decapping enzyme in the modulation of neuroendocrine signaling mechanisms that govern developmental processes and aging. Our model suggests that DCP1 controls the equilibrium between translation and storage or degradation of mRNAs encoding specific neuropeptides like insulin-like peptides. High levels of DCP1 promote decapping and storage or degradation while low levels favor translation and secretion of the corresponding neuropeptides. Such neuropeptides in turn act in distal cells to regulate lifespan and developmental events. Before concluding this presentation, I would like to thank all the people that contributed to this work from the Worm Lab and the Fly Lab of the Biomedical Research Foundation of the Academy of Athens, present and past members of our lab, our collaborators from the University of Athens, and of course, all of you for your attention. Thank you very much. Great, thank you, Fivos, and and there you are. He's live. Hello. All right. Uh, I'm so speaking live, but uh, I do not trust my internet connection. So I understand completely. Yes, mine's barely holding on. Um, so if anyone has any questions, please go ahead and, and put them in the chat. Um, so so I'll start. I mean, I think you know this is first of all, it's a really uh, nice uh, mechanistic story, and I and I love the you know going from one model system to another and showing that it it seems to work the same way in worms and flies. You know, I think that then the next obvious question is, you know, is there evidence for any similar sort of mechanism of regulation in in mammals, and do you think this might uh, be conserved, you know, for for human aging? 
Well, there is no evidence concerning aging, but uh, there is evidence that uh, decapin can serve as a regulator of uh, gene expression. There are data from uh, human cells that show that mRNA decapin maybe controls the expression of some uh, immunity-related genes. So we believe that there is a good chance that uh, the same mechanisms could apply in aging of mammals and all organisms. And that sort of leads to the other thing I was wondering about, which is, um, do you think that this, this regulation of the insulin-like peptides and insulin signaling is something that has has been selected for, and uh, this is asking you to speculate a little bit, but I mean, do you think that this is a regulated function of the, the mRNA decapping and, and, and why might that be that that, that would be a, a, a mechanism that's evolved to regulate these insulin-like peptides? Well, I don't think that this is specific to insulin-like peptides. I think that mRNA decapping has evolved as a mechanism to control uh, translation in general. And there is this uh, view that is developing, uh, developing uh, that uh, decapping uh, can control uh, gene expression through these cycles of uh, decapping and recapping. And there is a concept of cap homeostasis that is arising. So I believe that it is a general mechanism of uh, gene expression, not specific to insulin-like peptides, but we have, uh, we have discovered some targets of regulation. Great, thank you. Um, okay, well, I will ask one more question because I'm not I'm not seeing any others in the chat. I guess I'm wondering, you know, there are, there are a variety of environmental interventions like caloric restriction that have been reported to extend lifespan. And is there any evidence, or have you thought about looking to see whether there are environmental interventions that regulate that could regulate lifespan through this mRNA decapping mechanism? No, we haven't really checked, but that is very interesting. That is very interesting, and maybe we will check that. <laughs> okay, great. Thank you. Uh, and we are right on time. So, uh, so really appreciate you uh, giving that presentation and joining us in, in person. Thank you. Okay, so now we will uh, come back to Anne. She's, she's there. No uh, symposium of 2020 would be complete without dogs barking in the background and somebody's internet going out. So thank you for, for, uh, for saving us, Anne. Uh, go ahead and uh, load up your talk. And just to remind everybody, Anne's talk title is Late Life Restoration of Mitochondrial Function Reverses Cardiac Dysfunction in, in Old Mice. Hey, um, hello everyone. Hopefully this time the internet won't bail out on me. And um, uh, again, thank you Matt, for the introduction and thank you the organizer for the opportunity to present my work, uh, which is based on this recently published eLife paper. So I want to begin by acknowledging all the co-authors that participate in the study and contribute to this research, in particular, uh, Dr. Peter Mubinovich, which is my postdoc mentor. And um, most of the work is a postdoctoral fellow in his lab. And um, aging increases the risk of cardiovascular disease. And uh, in addition to increasing the risk of cardiovascular disease, aging also results in deterioration in uh, structure and function of the heart. And these cardiac aging phenotypes are very similar between human and in mouse model, which is what uh, we use in this particular study. And um, here I'm uh, showing a few uh, ca key cardiac aging phenotypes um, in uh, mouse model. So these are um, functional data, uh, data for a mouse at different age group from young, four to six months old, all the way to uh, over month old, old mouse. And uh, one cardiac aging phenotype, or one of the most uh, important changes is the decline in diastolic function. Um, EIA, uh, represent diastolic function. Um, and this parameter decreased with age and uh, for about 50%. And systolic function, on the other hand, is relatively, there's about 10% decline in ejection fraction over time, uh, over the course of aging in this animal. Myocardial performance is another thing we measure. And uh, this index actually increased with age and this increased index actually represent worsening of myocardial performance. And um, structurally, cardiac aging also uh, result in increase in uh, cardiac hypertrophy, which can be uh, measured by normalized heart rate 
and this uh, index increased uh, over the course of aging. Mitochondrial dysfunction is the hallmark of aging, and therefore um, targeting oxidative stress to improve mitochondrial function is an attractive approach to try to uh, intervene the process. In this 2005 study, the Rabinovich lab generated a transgenic mouse model to overexpress catalyzed specifically in mitochondria of the mouse. And what they've shown is that by scavenging mitochondrial hydrogen peroxide in this mouse by targeting the uh, catalyst in the mitochondria, they are getting an 18% increase in lifespan in this animal. And importantly, when they target a uh, catalyst in peroxisome or in nuclear, they are not seeing this improvement in lifespan which suggests the importance of targeting mitochondrial, work, mitochondrial rods versus just overall rods. And in, that, in addition to this lifespan extension, uh, MCAT mice also have attenuated cardiac aging phenotypes. And um, the red line here shows the function of uh, the MCAT mice compared to the black line, which are the wild type animal. And this improvement in MCAT mice, in, including uh, improved in diastolic and reduce uh, myocardial performance index, which suggests improved myocardial performance, and also reduce uh, cardiac hypertrophy. Um, however, all these uh, studies were done in transgenic animals, meaning that um, their mouse have lifelong reduction in their mitochondrial loss, and this can the development or prevent the development of these cardiac aging phenotypes. But from a translational point of view, it's more practical if we can have an intervention that can be started at late life and can suppress mitochondrial growth and reverse mitochondrial dysfunction and reverse pre-existing cardiac aging phenotypes, which is uh, the objective of this, uh, of this study is to determine if we can suppress growth only at late life and be able to uh, reverse cardiac aging And our hypothesis is that if we give uh, this late light into reduce mitochondrial loss, and in particular SS31 peptide or MCAT expression, we'll be able to improve their mitochondrial function and reverse pre existing cardiac aging phenotypes. And I'm sorry to, sorry to interrupt you. You cut out a little bit. Maybe if you shut off your video so that, so that uh, you have just a little bit less bandwidth usage. So your picture, I mean. Oh, okay. Might help a little bit. Okay, if let's not, see if that, yeah. Yeah, see if that's better. Um, okay, so the um, intervention we choose is uh, SS31 peptide, also named alamepatide. So this is a textual peptide drugs developed by Dr. Hazel Sito and Dr. Peter Schiller. And this is the structure of SS31. It's just a four amino acid peptide. It has been shown to uh, target to the inner membrane of the mitochondria by binding to uh, cardiolipin, which is a phospholipid that is exclusively present in the inner membrane of the mitochondria. This peptide has been shown to reduce mitochondrial oxidative stress in various models. And the major reason of why we choose this peptide is that this peptide shows similar protection in models of angiotensin-induced cardiac dysfunction and tech-induced heart failure uh, that are in a very similar manner uh, that, uh, with uh, mitochondrial catalyzed mice, uh, exp uh, uh, transgenic mice. So the uh, graph in here is showing that um, for diastolic function, which is um, impaired when we treat animal with angiotensin, uh, can be restored when we give animal SS31 peptide. And similarly, for by MCAT expression. And this is the reason why we choose um, this peptide as our target. And we first ask the question, uh, which question whether late five treatment of SS31 can reverse cardiac aging in mice. And we do that by uh, giving young and old C57 black cis mouse type mice with uh, SS31 through osmotic mini pump subcutaneously. And then we follow up on, the, we follow on uh, their cardiac function by echocardiography at baseline, four weeks and eight weeks. And uh, we also uh, assess their exercise performance at four and eight weeks by uh, treadmill running. So here's the result that we find uh, for diastolic function, which we measure uh, as uh, EAAA ratio. This um, 
parameters reduced with age. So compared to young animal, which usually have EAAA ratio of about 1.5, this ratio decreased to about one in all animals. Similarly, at baseline for the two different groups, and only in the SS31 treatment group, we are seeing an increase in uh, diastolic function, an improvement in diastolic function. And the other parameter, myocardial performance index, this index actually increased with age, as I mentioned earlier, uh, compared to young animal, which level would be around here. Um, old animal have increased MPI, and only in the SS31 treatment group, we are seeing a reduction in their myocardial performance index, suggesting an improvement in their myocardial performance. And old animal uh, also develop cardiac hypertrophy, which can be shown as uh, this normal rate data. In here, the old animal have increased normalized heart rate compared to the young. Uh, while in young animal, SS31 does not change cardiac hypertrophy. In old animal, SS31 reduced cardiac hypertrophy. And diastolic dysfunction is associated with exercise intolerance in human. So we want to measure whether SS31 treatment improved exercise performance. And this is treadmill running time of uh, these mouse uh, after uh, the eight weeks treatment. So in uh, old animal, they run significantly less time on the treadmill compared to young control and SS31 significantly improved exercise performance in old animal. Because SS31 target mitochondrial oxidative stress, so we measure whether oxidative stress uh, uh, loss level is uh, changed uh, the heart after SS31 treatment. And we use uh, mitosocks to measure superoxide. And these are, um, the data are summarized here. And we show that SS31 treatment significantly reduced mitochondrial superoxide level. And similarly, it also reduced mitochondrial perox uh, hydrogen peroxide level, uh, which is measured by a uh, mitoPY1 indicator. We then study whether SS31 improved mitochondrial function. And we did that by isolate uh, cardiomyocyte from uh, this an animal, young animal, or control animal, or old animal that are treated with eight weeks of SS31. So in this cardiomyocyte, we measure the uh, OCR uh, oxygen consumption uh, by using uh, CHOS mitostress test protocol. And the key findings is that um, all animal, uh, all cardiomyocyte actually have increased basal respiration compared to young. And this increase is completely uh, contributed by an increase in proton leak uh, without actually uh, in uh, ATP production. And so this age-related increase in basal respiration and proton leak are both attenuated uh, by SS31 treatment. At the time of the study, we don't know the molecular mechanism that uh, drive this uh, normalization of uh, age-related increase in proton leak, but a follow-up study that should publish today on eLife uh, by the Rabinovich lab have shown that ANT is probably the target of SS31. What they show is that similar to SS31, ANT inhibitor can also suppress the age-related increase in proton leak in this uh, cardiomyocyte. And ANT actually can uh, interact with SS31, so this is Biotinylated um, SS31 binding with ANT, and this binding can be uh, complete by uh, three uh, SS31. And sorry. also, um, this binding is inhibited when uh, treated by ANT. And a different study um, from James Booth's lab also uh, used cross-linked mass spectrometry to show that. SS31 can interact with ANT, and uh, they have more detailed mechanism of how SS31 interact with ANT and uh, reduce proton leak uh, in these two papers. And in addition to these changes in cell level, we also look at uh, a tissue level, um, how SS31 affect uh, oxidative stress. So we perform proteomic analysis to look at uh, as with the violation of uh, myocardial protein. And what we see is that uh, this is log two fold change of uh, glutathione violation. And the blue bar here are young versus old changes. And all the blue, most of the blue bar are on the right hand side of zero, suggesting that there's increased level 
of foot violation in old heart compared to young heart. And if we look at OSS31 treatment versus uh, young control, we can see this uh, red bars here all shift compared to the blue bar to zero uh, axis here, which suggests it attenuate increase in gutta violation in old heart. We also measure another um, protein oxidative modification, which is protein carbonylation. And uh, aging heart uh, has increased level of uh, protein gutta violation, and this is reduced by SS31 treatment. Phosphorylation of malfilament protein is a key regulator of diastolic function. And one of uh, these malfilament protein is mousine binding protein C. And uh, we observe reduction in phosphorylation of serine, S, serine uh, 282 at mousine binding protein C uh, in old heart. And this is reversed when we treat this animal with SS31. And um, to determine if increased, uh, if reduced mitochondrial oxidative stress is sufficient to um, improve diastolic function or reverse cardiac aging. We also um, express um, mitochondrial catalase only in old age by using a dental associate virus to uh, administer this transgene in a 24 month old animal. And what we see is that uh, by overexpressing MCAT using the virus, we can also improve diastolic function, similar to what we observed uh, with SS31 treatment. And um, we also try to combine the two interventions by giving MCAT animal, or MCAT animal with uh, SS31. And when we treat SS31 to wild type animal, we similarly, uh, we can increase um, their diastolic function as we shown in our uh, early, earlier data, but when we uh, look at the MCAT mice after SS31 treatment, there's no significant improvement in that diastolic function, which suggests that MCAT and SS31 improve diastolic function in very simple, uh, in overlapping mechanism. So when we combine the two, we are not getting uh, additive benefit in this case. And so I want to end this uh, presentation by um, showing you our proposed model based on our finding. So what we uh, show is that SS31 can reduce mitochondrial oxidative stress and uh, suppress uh, proton leak uh, in the mitochondria. And uh, the recent uh, paper from Rabinovich Labs uh, also um, identified AMT as the target of SS31 to suppress proton leak. And this uh, reduction of mitochondrial oxidative stress lead to a uh, downstream change in oxidative uh, modification and uh, lead to changes in phosphorylation of uh, malfilament protein and result in improved relaxation or uh, diastolic function of uh, this mouse in, in mouse. And uh, similarly, express uh, catalyzed in mitochondria. We can also uh, get similar improvement in diastolic function. And uh, there's some overlapping mechanism, the action of SS31 and mitochondrial catalyzed expression. And um, I will end the presentation with this and uh, um, we'll take uh, any of your questions. Thank you. Great, thanks, Anne. Uh, so we have a question from Alex Chen and he's asked, he asked specifically in the context of the MCAT mice, but um, I think the same question applies to the SS31, uh, whether or not you looked at the effects in tissues other than heart, like brain or, or other tissues where you know, mitochondrial activity is thought to be particularly important. Uh, so other studies have looked at that, not myself, uh, but many other groups have looked at the effect of uh, MCAT expression in other tissue. And SS31 also have been looked at in other tissue. And uh, for example, um, um, SS31, uh, we have collaboration with uh, Dave Masnick group and they show SS31 can improve uh, skeletal muscle function. Um, so attenuating uh, mitochondrial loss other than the improvement that we see in uh, cardiac muscle, there's also improvement in uh, skeletal muscle. 
And in fact, this um, intervention that target mitochondrial oxidative stress, like SS31, for example, is in clinical trial for uh, study that for um, disease that are heart related or in other organs, like in eyes and in muscle. So it's um, not specific just purely to the heart, it's um, actually have uh, broad therapeutic uh, benefit in multiple organs. And sort of related to that, do you know if anyone has done a lifespan, health span, frailty experiment, just looking, instead of looking at one tissue at a time, you know, aging out mice on SS31 and trying to characterize how well they're aging and how long they live? Right. So I think for SS31, because the way that we administer is by uh, osmotic mini pump, we're limited to uh, a very short period of treatment. So what we use is zero four weeks mini pump and we can only perform the treatment for eight weeks. And at, uh, we were um, trying to develop other regimen of SS31 that can be uh, given without uh, doing the osmotic mini pump. Um, and, but I don't think we have get there yet. Um, and so there are, study, because this is a program project at the Within the Rich Lab, there are study that they look at different uh, health span parameter in SS31 mice, uh, SS31 treat mice. This is limited to uh, late life uh, SS31 treatment, uh, but not uh, long-term SS31 treatment. Got it, that makes sense. Uh, and then we have a question, uh, does SS31 treatment induce mitophagy? Um, we, haven't looked in our heart tissue. Uh, so I don't know what this will do to mitophagy in particular. I think we have, uh, for only for the heart, we have not published the data, but we have looked at uh, autophagy marker, but we don't see an increase in autophagy with uh, SS31 treatment uh, in all heart. Okay. And then uh, the last question is sort of more generally related to, um, you know, how this might tie into the, the mixed results with antioxidant treatments. And I mean, your model, right, is that this is at least largely a ROS driven mechanism. And, and this is sort of related to a question I had, which is that, you know, um, there's also evidence that, that low levels of ROS, this sort of mitohormesis model can be beneficial. So, so, you know, what are you thinking about in terms of what does this mean with the varied data on antioxidant therapies? And could it be the case that, you know, SS31 is good in some context, but might actually, you know, prevent some of the benefits if you believe the mitohormesis model and things like that? Do you have any thoughts on yeah. that? Yeah, this is a great question. So uh, it's, um, has been pretty well documented that low level of ROS is important for signaling, um, but, uh, Ross signaling. So it's not something that we want to completely wipe out all the ROS in uh, the cell in the mitochondria. Um, and in fact, there are studies that show for MCAT expression, for example, if we have MCAT expression at a uh, uh, super high level, uh, it can actually be detrimental to uh, some uh, in, in the model of mitochondria induced cardiomyopathy and another model that is related to uh, some bacteriocidal um, response. So um, we definitely don't want to reduce ROS to uh, a very low level. And which is why uh, for an, like SS31, we probably want to target old age um, to reduce age-related increase in ROS, but not to suppress ROS at, um, when it's not um, at a high level or excess level. And which is the reason why this later life intervention is more uh, translatable compared to uh, some intervention that can life long, especially because um, I think in, is it also an MCAT study. So MCAT induced proteomics changes in young or in old animal in a very different way. So in uh, old animal, it actually reverses the age-related change in proteome, uh, while in young animal, it actually makes the proteomes look older. So uh, which is the basis of why we started this study at OH, trying to see if we can uh, improve by suppressing this excess ROS, uh, mitochondrial ROS only at OH. 
Okay, per perfect. Thanks, Dan. Uh, that was great. And I want to thank all of the um, speakers for this session and um, for the entire symposium. I'm sad to say we have uh, reached the end. Uh, so, um, so again, thank you to all the speakers and, and all of you who um, stuck out through the whole thing and stayed with us. Um, I just want to say sort of overall again, you know, how impressed I have been with the talks that we heard today and the the uh, submissions that we got for the special issue. I think, you know, as you've seen, um, this really reflected the diversity of, of science in the field of aging from very basic research, detailed mechanistic studies, all the way through to, to translational applications that are just on the cusp of really uh, making it into the clinic. And we had a good representation of model organisms, yeast, worms, flies, fish, mice, humans. Um, uh, so it's, it's just been, been fantastic to see uh, how, many, how many great um, papers we've had submitted and published in this special issue. Um, I just want to thank, in addition to the speakers, uh, Anya and Laura at eLife for uh, running this thing and keeping us on track. Um, I think it's gone particularly smoothly considering all of the challenges that we're all dealing with these days. Uh, and I will just leave with uh, encouraging you to please consider submitting your best papers to eLife. I think, um, you know, my experience now as a senior editor at eLife is that the, the process uh, works really well. Obviously, it's not perfect and not everybody is going to get the outcome that they want, but it's my feeling that it's, it's a, a very fair process. It's about as fair as we can make it, and it's a collaborative review process. Um, uh, that that I think has some benefits over the way a lot of uh, other journals uh, handle their papers. And, and I know that I speak on behalf of Jess and all the other senior editors when I say that we're committed to giving you a, a, a fair review for your papers. So please consider submitting your best papers to eLife. Um, and I'll turn it over to Jess if she has any sort of final concluding remarks. I just Thanks, Matt. I want to also acknowledge Maria Guerrero, who you guys don't know, but she has been phenomenal. She's the eLife person that's been behind the special issue. She's been working with us, um, helping us get through these 160 papers so far. And I, I also want to thank the speakers and the attendees for asking such great questions. Finally, I just really want to thank Matt. It's been amazing working with you. You're so responsive. He looks at the papers really quickly, answers my emails amazingly fast, and he knows his breadth of knowledge of aging is just really impressive. So thank you so much, Matt, and thank you all.